The Step by E. F. Benson Read by Richard Crowest John Cresswell was returning home one night from the Britannia Club at Alexandria, where, as was his custom three or four times in the week, he had dined very solidly and fluidly, and played bridge afterwards as long as a table could be formed. It had been rather an expensive evening, for all his skill at cards had been unable to cope with such a continuous series of ill-favoured hands as had been his. But he had consoled himself with reasonable doses of whisky, and now he stepped homewards in very cheerful spirits, for his business affairs were going most prosperously, and a loss of twenty-five or thirty pounds to-night would be amply compensated for in the morning. Besides, his bridge account for the year showed a credit, which proved that cards were a very profitable pleasure. It was a hot night of October, and being a big, plethoric man, he strolled at a very leisurely pace across the square and up the long street, at the far end of which was his house. There were no taxis on the rank, or he would have taken one and saved himself this walk of nearly a mile, but he had no quarrel with that, for the night air with a breeze from the sea was refreshing after so long a session in a smoke-laden atmosphere. Above, a moon near to its full cast a very clear white light on his road. There was a narrow strip of sharp-cut shadow beneath the houses on his right, but the rest of the street and the pavement on the left of it, where he walked, were in bright illumination. At first his way lay between rows of shops, European for the most part, with here and there a café where a few customers still lingered. Pleasant thoughts beguiled his progress— the Egyptian sugar crop, in which he was much interested, had turned out very well, and he saw a big profit on his options. Not less satisfactory were other businesses in which he did not figure so openly. He lent money, for instance, on a large scale to the native population, and these operations extended far up the Nile. Only last week he had been at Luxor, where he had concluded a transaction of a very remunerative sort. He had made a loan some months ago to a small merchant there, and now the appropriate interest on this was in default. In consequence, the harvest of a very fruitful acreage of sugar-cane was his. A similar and even richer windfall had just come his way in Alexandria, for he had advanced money a year ago to a Levantine tobacco merchant on the security of his freehold store. This had brought him in very handsome interest, but a day or two ago the unfortunate fellow had failed, and Cresswell owned a most desirable freehold. The whole affair had been very creditable to his enterprise and sagacity, for he had privately heard that the municipality was intending to lay out the neighbourhood, a slum at present, where this store was situated, in houses of flats, and make it a residential quarter— and his newly acquired freehold would thus become a valuable property. At present the tobacco merchant lived with his family in holes and corners of the store, and they must be evicted to-morrow morning. John Cresswell had already arranged for this, and had told the man that he would have to quit. He would go round there in the forenoon and see that they and their sticks of furniture were duly bundled out into the street. He would see personally that this was done, and looked forward to doing so. The old couple were beastly creatures, the woman a perfect witch who eyed him and muttered. But there was a daughter who was not ill-looking, and someone of the beggared family would be obliged to earn bread. He did not dwell on this, but the thought just flitted through his brain— then doors would be locked and windows barred in the store that was now his, and he would lunch at the club afterwards. He was popular there, he had a jovial geniality about him, and a habit of offering drinks before they could be offered to him. That, too, was good for business. Ten minutes strolling brought him to the end of the shops and cafés that formed the street, and now the road ran between residential houses— each detached and with a space of garden surrounding it, where dry-leaved palms rattled in this wind from the sea. 
He was approaching the flamboyant Roman Catholic Church, to which was attached a monastic establishment, a big white barrack-looking house where the Brothers of Poverty or some such order lived. Something to do with St. Mark, he vaguely remembered, who by tradition had brought Christianity to Egypt nearly nineteen hundred years ago. Often he met one of these odd, sandal-footed creatures, with his brown habit, his rosary, and his cowled head going in or out of their gate, or toiling in their garden. He did not like them. Lousy fellows, he would have called them. Sometimes in their mendicant errands they came to his door asking alms for the indigent copts. Not long ago he had found one actually ringing the bell of his front door instead of going humbly round to the back as befitted his quality, and Cresswell told him that he would loose his bulldog on the next of their breed who ventured within his garden gate. How the fellow had skipped off when he heard talk of the dog! He dropped one of his sandals in his haste to be gone, and not sparing the time to adjust it again, had hopped and hobbled over the sharp gravel to gain the street. Cresswell had laughed aloud to see his precipitancy, and the best of the joke was that he had not got any sort of dog on his premises at all. At the remembrance of that humorous incident he grinned to himself as he passed the door of the church. He paused a moment to mop his forehead and to light a cigarette, looking about him in great good humour. Before him and behind the road was quite empty. Lights gleamed behind Venetian shutters from a few upper windows of the houses, but all the world was in bed or on its way there. There were still three or four hundred yards to go before he came to his house, and as he turned his face homewards again and walked a little more briskly, he heard a step behind him, sharp and distinct, not far in his rear. He paid no heed. Someone, late like himself, was going home, walking in the same direction, for the step followed him. His cigarette was ill-lit, a little core of burning stuff fell from it onto the pavement, and he stopped to rekindle it. Possibly some subconscious region of his mind was occupied with the step which had sprung up so oddly behind him in the empty street, for while he was getting his cigarette to burn again he noticed that the step had ceased. It was hardly worth while to turn round, so little the matter interested him, uh, but a casual glance showed him that the wayfarer must have turned into one of the houses he had just passed, for the whole street, brightly moonlit, was as empty as when he surveyed it a few minutes before. Soon he came to his own gate and clanged it behind him. The eviction of the Levantine merchant took place in the morning, and Cresswell watched his porters carrying out the tawdry furniture— a few tables, a few chairs, a sofa covered in tattered crimson plush, a couple of iron bedsteads, a bundle of dirty sheets and blankets. He was not certain in his own mind whether these paltry articles did not by rights belong to him, but they were fit for nothing except the dust heap, and he had no use for them. There they stood in the clean, bright sunshine, rubbish and no more, blocking the pavement, and a policeman told their owner that he had best clear them away at once unless he wanted trouble. There was the usual scene to which he was quite accustomed, the man's wife, snivelling and slovenly, witch-like and early old, knelt and kissed his hand and wheezingly besought his compassion. She called him excellency, she promised him her prayers, which she desired as little as her pots and pans. She invoked blessings on his head, for she knew that out of his pity he would give them a little more time. They had nowhere to go, nor any roof to shelter them. Her husband had money owing to him, and he would collect these debts and pay his default as sure as there was a God in heaven. This was a changed note from her mutterings of yesterday, but of course Cresswell had a deaf ear for this oily rigmarole, and presently he went into the store to see that everything had been removed. It was in a filthy, dirty state. Floors were rotten and the paint peeling, but the whole place would soon be broken up, and he was not going to spend a piastre on it so long as the ground on which it stood was his. Then he saw to the barring of the windows and the doors, and he gave the policeman quite a handsome tip to keep an eye on the place and take care that these folk did not get ingress again. 
When he came out, he found that the old man had procured a handcart, and he and his son were loading it up. So, of course, they had somewhere to go. It was all a pack of lies about their being homeless. The old hag was squatting against the house wall, but now there were no more prayers and blessings for him, and she had taken to her mutterings again. As for the daughter, seen in the broad daylight, she had a handsome face, but she was sullen and dirty and forbidding, and he gave no further thought to her. He hailed a taxi and went off to the club for lunch. Though Cresswell, in common parlance, did himself well, taking his fill of food and drink and tobacco, he was also careful of that great strong body of his, and the occasions were few when he omitted, at the end of the day's work, to walk out in the direction of Ramley for a brisk hour or two, or during the hotter months to have a good swim in the sea and a bask in the sun. On the day following this eviction he took a tramp along the firm sands of the coast, and then, turning inland, struck the road that would bring him back to his own house. This stood quite at the end of the rows of detached houses past which he had walked two evenings before. Beyond the road ran between tumbled sand dunes and scrub-covered flats. Here and there, in sheltered hollows, a few Arab goat herds and such had made themselves nomadic, tent-like habitations of a primitive sort. Half a dozen posts set in the sand supported a roof of rugs and blankets stitched together. If they encroached too near the outskirts of the town, the authorities periodically made a clearance of them, for they were apt to be light-fingered, pilfering folk, whose close vicinity was not desirable. Today, as he returned from his walk, Cresswell saw that a tent of this kind had newly been set up within twenty yards of his own garden wall. That would not do at all. That must be seen to, and he determined as soon as he had had his bath and his change of clothes to ring up his very good friend, the chief inspector of police, and request its removal. As he got nearer to it, he saw that it was not quite of the usual type— the roof was clearly an outworn European carpet, and standing outside it on the sand were chairs and a sofa. Somehow these seemed familiar to him, though he could not localise the association. Then out of the tent came that old Levantine hag who had kissed his hand and knelt to him yesterday, invoking on him all sorts of blessings and prosperities, if only he would have compassion. She saw him for now not more than a few dozen yards separated them, and then, suddenly pointing at him, she broke out into a gabble and yell of curses. That made him smile. "'So you've changed your tune again, have you?' he thought. "'For that doesn't sound much like good wishes. Curse away, old woman, if it relieves your mind, for it doesn't hurt me.' but you'll have to be shifting once more, for I'm not going to have you and your like squatting there. Cresswell rang up his friend, the chief inspector of police, and was most politely told that matter should be seen to in the morning. Sure enough, when he set out to go to his office next day, he saw that it was being attended to, for the European carpet which had served for a roof was already down, and the handcart was being laden with the stuff. He noticed quite casually that the two women and the boy were employed in lading it. The Levantine was lying on the sand and taking no part in the work. Two days later he had occasion to pass the pauper cemetery of Alexandria, where the poorest kind of funeral was going on. The coffin was being pushed to the side of the shallow grave on a handcart. A boy and two women followed it he could see who they were. He dined that night at the club in rare good humour with the affairs of life. Already the municipality had offered him for his newly acquired freehold a sum that was double the debt for which it had been security, and though possibly he might get more if he stuck out for a higher price, he had accepted it, and the money had been paid into his bank that day. To get a hundred percent in a week was very satisfactory business, and who knew but that some new scheme of improvement might cause them to change their plans, leaving him with a ramshackle building on his hands for which he had no manner of use. 
He enjoyed his dinner and his wine, and particularly did he enjoy the rubber of bridge that followed. All went well with his finesses. He doubled his adversaries two or three times with the happiest results. They doubled him and were sorry for having spoken. And there would be a very pleasant item to enter in his card account that evening. It was later than usual when he quitted the club. Just outside there was a beggar woman squatting at the edge of the pavement who held her palm towards him and whined out blessings. Good-naturedly he fumbled in his pocket for a couple of piastres, and the blessings poured out in greater shrillness and copiousness as she pushed back the black veil that half-shrouded her face to thank him for his beneficence to the needy widow. Next moment she threw his arms on the pavement, she spat at him, and like a moth she flitted away into the shadows. Cresswell recognised her, even as she had recognised him, and picked up his piastres. It was amusing to think that the old hag so hated him that even his arms were abhorrent to her. "'I'll drop them into that collecting box outside the church,' he thought to himself. Tonight, late though it was, there were many folk about in the square, natives for the most part, padding softly along, and there were still a few taxis on the rank. But he preferred to walk home.' for he had been so busy all day that he had given his firm, fat body no sort of exercise. So, crossing the square, he went up the street which led to his house. Here the cafés were already closed, and soon the pavements grew empty. The waning moon had risen, and though the lights of the street grew more sparse as he emerged into the residential quarter, his way lay bright before him. In his hand he still held the two piastres which had been flung back at him, ready for the collection box. He walked briskly, for the night was cool, and it was no exercise to saunter. Not a breath of wind stirred the air, and the clatter of the dry palm leaves was dumb. He was now approaching the Roman Catholic Church, when a step suddenly sounded out, crisp and distinct, behind him. He remembered then for the first time what had happened some nights ago, and halted and listened. Not a sound broke the stillness. He whisked round, but the street seemed empty. On he went again now, and more slowly, and there was the following step again, neither gaining on him nor falling behind, to judge by the loudness of it. It could be no more than a dozen paces in his rear, Then a very obvious explanation occurred to him, and no doubt this was some echo of his own footsteps. He went more quickly, and the steps behind him quickened. He stopped, and they stopped. The whole thing was clear enough, and not a shadow of uneasiness or anything approaching it was in his mind. He slipped his ironical arms into the collecting box outside the church, and was amused to hear that they evoked no tinkle from within. "'Quite a little windfall for those brown-gowned fellows, "'and they'll buy another rosary,' he said to himself. "'And soon, with the echo of his own steps following, "'he turned in at his gate. "'Once inside he slipped behind a myrtle bush "'that stood at the edge of the gravel walk "'to see if, by chance, any one passed on the road outside. "'But nothing happened, and his theory of the echo, "'though it was odd that he should never have noticed it till so lately,' seemed quite confirmed. From that night onwards he made it a practice, if he dined at the club, to walk home. Sometimes the step followed him, but not always, and this was an objection to that sensible echo theory. But the matter was no sort of worry to him, except sometimes when he woke in the night and found that his brain, still drowsy and not in complete control, was brooding over it with an ever-increasing preoccupation. Often that misgiving faded away, and he dropped off to dreamless sleep again. Sometimes it was sufficiently disquieting to bring him broad awake, and then, with all his senses about him, it vanished. But there was this condition, halfway between waking and sleeping, when, in the twilight chamber of his brain, something listened, something feared. When fully awake, 
he no more thought of it than he thought of that frowsy Levantine tobacco merchant whom he had evicted and whose funeral he chanced to have seen. Early in December, his cousin and partner in the sugar business came down from Cairo to spend a week with him. Bill Cresswell may be succinctly described as a hot lot, and often after dinner at the club he left his cousin to his cronies and the sedata pleasures of bridge, and went out with a duplicate latchkey in his pocket on livelier private affairs. One night, the last of Bill's sojourn here, there was nothing doing, and the two set forth together homewards from the club. A nice night, let's walk, said John. Nothing like a walk when there's liquid on board. It clears the brain, for you and I must have a final powwow tonight if you're off tomorrow. There are some bits of things still to go through. Bill acquiesced. The cafes were all closed. There was nothing very promising. Nightlife here ain't a patch on Cairo, he observed. Everyone seems to go to bed here just about when we begin to get going. Not but what I haven't enjoyed my stay with you. Capital good fellows at your club, and brandy to match. He stopped and ruefully scanned the quiet and emptiness of the street. Not a soul anywhere, he said. Shut us up, all gone to bed. Nothing for it but a powwow, I guess. They walked on in silence for a while. Then, behind them, firm and distinct to John's ears, there sprang up the sound of the footsteps, for which now he knew that he waited and listened. He wheeled round. "'What's up?' asked Bill. "'Curious thing,' said John. Uh, "'Night after night now, though not every night, when I walk home, I hear a step following me. I heard it then.' Bill gave a Venus giggle. (laughs) "'No such luck for me,' he said. "'I like to hear a step following me about one of a morning. "'Something agreeable may come of it. "'Wish I could hear it.' "'They walked on, and again, clearer than before, "'John heard what was inaudible to the other. "'He told himself, as he often did now, "'that it was an echo. "'But it was odd that the echo only repeated the footfalls of one of them.' As he recognised this, he felt for the first time when he was fully awake some sudden chill of fear. It was as if a cold hand closed for a moment on his heart, just pressing it softly, almost tenderly. But they were now close to his own gate, and presently it clanged behind them. Bill returned next day to the gladder life of Cairo, John Cresswell saw him off at the station, and was passing out into the street again through the crowd of loungers and porters and passengers, when there defined itself to his ear the sound of that footstep, which he now knew so well. How he recognised it and isolated it from the tread of so many other feet he had no idea. Simply his brain told him that it was following him again. He took a taxi to his office, and as he mounted the white stone stairs, once more it was on his track. Once more the gentle pressure of cold fingers seemed to assure him of the presence that, though invisible, was very close to him, and now it was as if those fingers were pressed on some bell-push in his brain, and there sounded out a shrill tingle of fear. So hard-headed and sensible a man, of course, had nothing but scorn for all the claptrap, bogey tales of spirits and ghosts and hauntings, and he would have welcomed any sort of apparition in which the step manifested itself in order to have the pleasure of laughing in its face. He would have liked to see a skeleton or some shrouded figure stand close to him. He would have slashed at it with his stick and convinced himself that there was nothing there— Whatever his own eyes appeared to see could not be so unnerving as these tokens of the invisible. A stiff drink pulled him together again, and for the rest of the day there occurred no repetition of that tapping step which had begun to sprout with terror for him. In any case, he was determined to fight it, for he realised that it was chiefly his own fear that troubled him. No doubt he was suffering from some small, nervous derangement. He had been working very hard, and after Christmas, if the thing continued to worry him, probably he would see a doctor who would prescribe him some tonic 
or some sedative which would send the step into the limbo from which it had come. But it was more probable that his cure was in his own hands. His own resistance was all the medicine he needed. It was in pursuance of this very sane policy that he set out that night after an evening at the club to walk home. He faced it just because he knew that some black well was digging itself into his soul. To yield, to take a taxi, was to retreat, and if he did that, if he gave way an inch, he guessed that he might be soon flying in panic before an invading and imaginary host of phantoms. He had no use for phantoms. The solid satisfactions of life were enough occupation. Once more, as he drew near the church, the step sprang up, and now he sought no longer to tell himself it was an echo. Instead, he fixed his mind on it, saying to himself, There it is, and it can't hurt me. Let it walk all day and night behind me if it chooses. It's got a fancy for me. Then his garden gate shut behind him, and with a sigh of relief he knew that he had passed out of its beat, for when once he was within, it never came farther. He stood for a moment on his threshold after he had opened his door, pleased with himself for having faced it. The bright light shone full on the straight gravel walk he had just traversed. It was quite empty, and nothing was looking in through his gate. Then he heard from close at hand the crunch of the gravel underneath the heel of some invisible wayfarer. Now was the time to assert himself again, to look his fear in the eyes and mock at it. "'Come along, whoever you are,' he called, "'and have a drink before you get back to hell. Something cooling. Drop of cold water, isn't it?' Thick sweat had broken out on his forehead, and his hand on the doorknob shook as with ague as he stood there looking out onto the bright, empty path. But he did not flinch from the lesson he was teaching himself. The seconds ticked away. He could count them from the pulse that hammered in his throat. "'I'll give it a hundred beats,' he said to himself, "'and then I'll say good night to Mr. Nothing at all.' He counted his hundred. He gave ten beats more for good luck. "'Good night, you old fraud,' he said, and went in and secured the door. It seemed indeed for the week that followed that he had rightly gauged the nature of the hallucination which had threatened to establish its awful dominion over him. Never once, whether by day or night, did there come to his ears that footfall which he feared and listened for, nor, if in the dead hours of the darkness he lay for a while between sleep and waking, did he quake with a sense that something unseen and aware was watching him. A little courage, a flat denial of his fears, had been sufficient not only to scotch them, but to snuff out the manifestation which had caused them. He kept his thoughts well in hand. He would not even conjecture what had been the cause of that visitation. Occasionally, while it still vexed him, he had cast about for the origin of it. He had wondered whether that shrill Levantine hag calling curses on him could somehow have found root in his mind. But now it was past and done with. He would have a few days' remission from work if it was overwork that had been at the bottom of it at Christmas, and perhaps it would be prudent not to be quite so free with the club brandy. On Christmas Eve he and his friend sat at their bridge till close on midnight, then lingered over a drink, wished each other seasonable greetings, and dispersed. Cresswell hesitated as to whether he should not take a taxi home, for the object with which he had trudged back there so often seemed to be gained, and he no longer feared the recurrence of the step. But he thought he would just set the seal on his victory, and went on foot. He had come to the point in his walk where he had first heard the step. Tonight, as usual, there was none, and he stopped a moment looking round him securely and serenely. It was a bright night, luminous with a moon a little after the full, and it amazed him to think that he had ever fashioned a terror to himself in this quiet, orderly street. From not far ahead there came the sound of the bells of the church saluting Christmas morning. 
they would have been holding their midnight mass there. He breathed the night air with content, and throwing the butt of his spent cigar into the roadway, he walked on again. With a sudden sinking of his heart, he heard behind him the step which he thought he had silenced for ever. It was faint at first, but tonight, instead of keeping at a uniform distance behind him, it was approaching. Louder and more crisp it sounded, until it was close to him. On and on it came, still gaining on him, and now there brushed by him, though not quite touching him, the figure of a man in European dress, with his head wrapped in a shawl. "'Hello, you there,' called Cresswell. "'You're the skunk who's been following me, are you, and slipping out of sight again? "'No more of your damned conjuring tricks. Let's have a look at you.' The figure, now some two or three yards ahead of him, stopped at the sound of his voice and turned round. The shawl covered its face, but for a narrow chink between the edges. "'So you understand English,' said Cresswell. "'Now I'll thank you to take that shawl off your face and let me see who it is that's been dogging me.' The man raised his hands and threw back the shawl. The moonlight shone on his face, and that face was just a slab of smooth, yellowish flesh extending from ear to ear, empty as the oval of an egg, without eyes or nose or mouth. From the upper edge of the shawl where it crossed the forehead there depended a few wisps of grey hair. Cresswell looked, and a wave of panic fear submerged his very soul. He gave a little thin squeal and started to run, listening the while in an agony of terror to hear if the steps of that nameless, faceless creature were following. He must run, he must run to get away from that thing out of hell which had manifested itself. Then, close at hand, he saw the lights of the church, and there perhaps he could find sanctuary from it. The door was open, and he sprang up the steps. Close by there were lights burning on the altar of a side chapel, and he flung himself on his knees. Not for years had he attempted to pray, and now in the agony of his soul he could but say in a gabbling whisper, "'Oh, my God! Oh, my God!' Over and over he said it. By degrees some sort of self-control came back to him. There were holy images, there was a sacred picture above the altar, a smell of hallowing incense was in the air. Surely there was protection here, a power that would intervene between him and the terror of that face. A sort of tranquillity overscored his panic, and he began to look round. The church was darker than it had been when he entered, and he saw that some of those cowled, brown-habited men of the order were moving quietly about, quenching the lights. Those at the altar in front of which he knelt were still bright, and now he saw one of these cowled figures move up close to him, as if waiting for him to finish his devotions. He was calm now, his panic had quite passed, and he rose from his knees. "'I've had a terrible fright, father,' he said to the monk. "'I saw something just now out in the street which must have come out of hell.' The figure turned a little towards him, the cowl concealed its face altogether, and the voice came muffled. "'Indeed, my son,' he said, "'tell me what it is that frightened you.' Cresswell felt some backwash of his panic returning. "'A man passed me as I was going back to my house,' he said, "'and I told him to stop and let me have a look at him. "'He wore a shawl over his head, and he threw it back. "'Oh, my God! That face!' "'The monk quietly raised his hands and grasped the edges of his cowl. "'Then, with a quick movement, he threw it back. "'That sort of face,' he said.' 